Well, thank you very much um, for this invitation. Oops, under, under consideration of the ongoing crisis, um, I uh, thought I would uh, reduce um, the, my, my perspective a bit um, um, on the post-World War II period. That also makes sense, as Johannes Müller has already said, because um, thanks um, to the collapse of the National Socialist regime, um, we, at least in Western Germany, had the opportunity to start all over again. Uh, of course, there is a longer European history within the German history. Just think of the ancient empire, which was founded by Otto the Great in the 10th century, and which, thanks to Napoleon, was shut down as a nearly dead body <laughs> in 1806. And uh, it's quite interesting, because uh, the defeat um, of, of uh, the German states uh, uh, under the impact of Napoleon triggered a discussion about uh, the German nation and its essence. And uh, due to the historical past, um, the ancient empire always played um, the role of a model. And uh, that uh, means that the debate about the German nation state, uh, which, uh, well, gained speed uh, after the defeat of Napoleon, um, always had a Central European dimension. And this Central European dimension can be taken as a kind of red feather of uh, German politics, at least after 1819, uh, when Bismarck retired and um, different perspectives on German politics uh, took over. It can be taken as a red feather um, that uh, Germany uh, plays by natural law, um, leading position within Central Europe. Nobody can identify uh, the exact borderlines of Central Europe, but anyway, it was taken as a model. And uh, after the defeat uh, of World War I, um, this idea re-emerged in uh, the German discussion about Europe and finally ended up uh, in the National Socialist Großraumdenken. Uh, the imperial visions of the National Socialists. And, um, well, it all ended in 1945, and um, the situation post-World War II was different. Germany was divided into four zones of occupation. Um, the country uh, was, uh, well, to a large extent, simply destroyed. And uh, the people uh, living there, well, their task was to survive, more or less, and to rebuild uh, Germany. And then the debate about a European solution uh, took off, and uh, it was um, well perceived uh, it, it, by, by a large <coughs> group of Germans, especially young intellectuals, um, who... Um, could imagine that a European solution of whatever kind, because there were many different proposals uh, presented in the years between 45 and 1950, um, this, this idea to create a unified euro seemed to be a real alternative to warfare. And uh, that is why... Um, group of students from France and from Germany met at the French-German border uh, in 1915 and um, simply took off the turnpikes and burned them. I mean, burning things has a certain tradition in German history, but in this case, um, I think uh, it, it was the idea of, of, of uh, well, overcoming borders and establishing a completely new system, which was very well perceived. Also uh, by German politicians, by leading German politicians. I mean, there was a vast debate uh, in Germany going on how um, Europe could be organized, especially after Robert Schumann uh, presented his plan for a European coal and steel community on 10th May 1915, um, which gave an impression of, um, well, what direction this unification of Europe, or at least of the original six. I mean, we are talking about Germany, we are talking about France, 
We are talking about Benelux and we are talk, talking about Italy. But especially the German-French combination, I mean, just think of um, um, the, the, the speech, for instance, by Churchill or by, by Burns uh, in, in, in Stuttgart, his Churchill's speech in Zürich. It was uh, the, the, the precondition of a successful uh, unification of European states. The Germans and the French had to overcome their animosity, which was deeply rooted in history. You know, I mean, the, the, the ancient empire on the, on the one side of the Rhine and, and the envy on the other side of the Rhine. I mean, that, that's, that's a model. And, and for Napoleon, it, it must have been a correction of, of, a, of, a, of a fatal historical process, which took on for a couple of centuries. So, um, I mean, that's, that's the, the, the precondition of, of uh, any attempt to unify in which way ever the European states, or at least a group of European states. What you see here are burning turnpikes, right? But also it's an expression of hope that uh, there might be a European solution in the end. Um, obviously enough, if you look at the ongoing debate about um, the European Union and if you look at uh, the arguments presented by the populists, certain parts of the um, popula population of the member states of the EU seem to want to go back into the 19th century and to re-establish a situation which actually uh, was supposed to be overcome by the integration process post-World War II. Um, that's, uh, that has to be carried in mind, I think, and this, this is very uh, important um, to, to uh, remember it. Um, when we look at uh, the uh, German narratives of Europe, which uh, took place in the 1950s, you have to um, also um, consider that uh, the situation um, was, was a bit difficult in Germany. It's not Germany, it's Western Germany. I'm talking about Western Germany because there was an iron curtain uh, um, right through from the north to the south, uh, which actually destroyed the final remains of Central Europe. Central Europe as a geographical thing didn't exist. Anymore. So it was Western Germany, which also meant that the perspectives of the West Germans were no longer focused on Central German ideas, but on um, West, Western European sort of dimensions. Yeah? The relations between Germ Western Germany and um, the, 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 the neighboring states, France, uh, um, uh, the most important uh, of them, and of course, uh, the relations to the United States of America, which um, I will uh, come back to again uh, a bit later on. Uh, the public support uh, for a pro-European policy, um, if you, well, uh, think in majority terms, of course, there have been other comments, but any uh, way, the public support was relatively high, high, although I would call it benevolent casual. Yeah, because, I mean, the, there were other things to do. Um, the model which was presented, uh, or the, the idea uh, of a European coal and steel community, was a very abstract idea and very difficult to understand uh, by, by, by the ordinary citizen. It was even difficult to understand by, by experienced politicians. Because I remember um, an interview which I had with uh, Hans von der Gruben, who became um, German commissioner in uh, the European uh, Economic um, Community uh, Commissions led by Walter Hallstein uh, in the 1960s. And he said he was a member of staff of the German Ministry of Finance and he was supposed to explain uh, the functioning of the European coal and steel community to, to, to economists. And the answer was, this cannot work. And as a matter of fact, uh, it was very difficult to get it to work because it was a genuine political thing. And the idea behind it was to build on this very small starting point, a much larger project, <coughs> may even be a federation of European states. I don't know whether Walter Hallstein had this federation idea in mind. He, his, the, the first edition of his book, which he published after his retreat, 
uh, had the um, title, uh, bore the title, uh, the uh, incomplete uh, federation, and it was later on changed um, into a, a different title, which I can remember right now. But um, that's the problem, you know, when you talk about federations, um, the question is, what shape will this federation have? There are different notions of, of federation, so it's, it's a rather open concept. Anyway, back to the integration process uh, triggered uh, by, by the European coal and steel concept of Monet and, and, and Robert Schumann uh, was highly welcomed by Adenauer because uh, Adenauer considered this concept as a loophole, as a way out of the isolation, of, of the political isolation of Western Germany, a reintegration into the group or at least a group of uh, European neighboring states. Yeah? The uh, re-entry um, onto the international political stage. A very small step still and a very modest concept still, but it was a way out of the isolation and a way back into the community states again. What you see here is indeed um, an expression, I think, of um, the vagueness or at least of the perceived vagueness of the uh, European coal and steel community concept. You know, I mean, it's um, it's uh, Schumann, Schumann's dreams, you know, the Montan Union, the European community of coal and steel, could emerge out of this idea, maybe. That's the perception of uh, June 1950. It was difficult to understand, but it was benevolently received in Germany. Um, the consequences actually were uh, uh, absolutely not clear. There was a, a row going on uh, in the German cabinet between Adenauer, who was in favor of the concept, and Ludwig Erhard uh, as minister um, for economic affairs. Because uh, Erhard was a staunch free trader. And he wanted to establish a worldwide, a global system, free trade system. That was uh, his vision. And he thought, well, if we create a closed European shop, this might endanger uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, creation uh, of a worldwide free, uh, free trade area. So there was, um, it, it, it took a while to overcome this, um, this, this conflict. And uh, in the end, uh, Erhard gave in because he understood that uh, the political dimension of uh, the concept, the integration, the idea of establishing a supranational European community was overriding his sort of uh, economic, uh, global economic uh, ideas. Um, but he never was convinced that uh, this uh, creation would uh, in the end, lead to a uh, into a workable uh, situation. So he was he was a bit um, sort of skeptic still, um, although at least officially he supported Adenauer's um, yeah uh, idea of, of 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 supporting the Schumann plan. Here we see um, the perception of the um, the perce or a, a, a picture which uh, perceives. Uh, uh, the the um, um, failure of the European defense community system. Uh, quite interesting, um, uh, Adenauer, um, who originally, when the debate started uh, to re-establish West, uh, 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 West German armed forces, uh, did not like the idea of a European defense community, but was uh, actually in favor of the NATO solution. And, um, well, uh, it, it, it took a while, um, at least, um, and, and some, some pressure by, by the French colleagues to uh, convince uh, Adenauer that the idea of a European defense community, uh, which actually was supposed to be to cooperate closely with NATO, could be a good idea because it also fostered the European integration process. Nonetheless, because um, the existence of the European coal and steel community on the one side and uh, an existence of the European defense community required also the European political community, which was a kind of, 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 of juncture between the two communities um, um, with um, 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 a government, at least uh, the defense secretary and uh, well, 
a, a secretary in charge uh, for economic affairs and uh, some leading person as well. So the basic structures of a government, um, it uh, was supposed to have a parliament and of course the European Court of Justice. Yeah? So what we see here um, in this concept of a European political community uh, where um, uh, the at least basic structures of, of, of a state, uh, of a nation state. Um, as we know, 30th August 1954, um, uh, this concept uh, was uh, dead and gone. Um, interestingly enough, the Paris Treaty of 54 was signed only six or seven weeks later. For me, it means that uh, the Paris Treaty, even the texts, were already printed. They were just laying in a drawer and waiting to be uh, taken out. You know, I mean, six or seven weeks after the failure of a concept which was ratified by five or six member states already. Yeah, that means finding a date when everybody had time to uh, travel to Paris and, and to, 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 to sign the Paris Treaty. They must have been ready. It was plan B, worked out, uh, completely worked out. So uh, the Paris Treaty, the Paris Treaties, the Paris Treaty of 54, of October 54, finally enabled the entry uh, into uh, uh, Germans, West Germans entry into NATO. And Adenauer, well, he's, uh, when I look at this picture, um, he looks very, well, proud in a way, energetic, and uh, wants to, uh, well, pay his share to a certain extent. Um, we've already heard about uh, the Messina process, uh, the Relance Européenne, um, after um, the um, failure of the European defense community. Um, an interesting uh, development, we see again two different concepts um, within the integration process. On the one side, uh, the French concept of sectoral integration, uh, which uh, was uh, firstly tried out in the European coal and steel community, and the German concept of horizontal integration. Meaning, if you want to integrate economy, do it completely, do it all inclusive. Because it really doesn't make sense to take certain sectors out of uh, um, uh, the economic, uh, uh, the global economic thing and unify it and leave others out. So um, in this case, uh, the, um, um, this, this horizontal approach uh, was successful. There was a compromise because uh, the creation of the European uh, Atomic Energy um, uh, um, uh, Council uh, was um, um, a French preference and, and uh, it, it also reflects uh, the importance which uh, especially the French, uh, the French government uh, paid to uh, nuclear energy, the civil usage of nuclear energy. And we've already heard about um, the rapprochement, uh, uh, the, the, the um, well, um, <coughs> improving relations between Germany and France. And we've uh, seen pictures about uh, the, the meeting of Arnaud and de Gaulle in the Reims Cathedral. Um, there was an idea behind it, you know, uh, De Gaulle needed allies for his concept of establishing a confederation of European states, of deviating uh, the direction which uh, the European integration process uh, took after uh, the establishment of, of the European Econ Economic Community in 1957-58. Um, uh, Adenauer's performance here in, uh, in, in Bonn, for instance, was, was, was impressive. And, and he, he really impressed uh, the people of Bonn. And uh, he, uh, his, his speech uh, is a remarkable piece of, of political rhetoric. And uh, if, when you uh, watch Adenauer giving, uh, not Adenauer, when you uh, watch the goal giving his speech, um, uh, you get the impression that he was convinced of that, what he said. So um, that's uh, one side, but obviously enough, um, there were other um, um, sides of the goal, and uh, the German Michel here in front uh, was a bit puzzled uh, which role actually uh, de Gaulle uh, played, which idea he had. Was he 
um, the, the successor of Napoleon, was he, uh, he a civil servant, was he Louis XIV, or was he Monsieur le Général? Uh, that was uh, the question. Which role did he play? What, what were his intentions? Especially uh, when you consider that on the one hand, what you see here uh, is uh, the signing of the, uh, it must be the signing of the Élysée Treaty in uh, 1963. Yes. And um, there were two factions, factions uh, in, in the German government. One um, uh, group um, staunchly supporting uh, the um, 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 uh, closer cooperation with France. And the other uh, a group was, I would call them transatlantic group, um, a group which was uh, deeply interested in, in, in um, keeping up uh, good relations with the United States. So it was the second group which actually deviated the direction of the Elysee uh, Treaty text, much to the disappointment of Charles de Gaulle. Uh, but still, I mean, we know today that uh, the um, Elysee Treaty can be taken as the starting point for close German, French German cooperation uh, within Europe, within the European Union, and 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 above, you know. So the importance of the Elysee Treaty should not be neglected. Um, that's already said and done. Um, de Gaulle um, finally. Um, had to give up uh, in the end of the 60s, Pompidou as its successor, and, and I see uh, as a next um, important um, um, peak in the history of the European uh, integration process, uh, the um, um, Hague Summit of December 1969, because um, the heads of um, uh, the member states there had to decide about uh, the future direction of the integration process under the impact of the pending enlargement, of the pending first enlargement. But by in 69, still four candidate states, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Denmark, and Norway. And uh, the, they decided uh, to, um, on the one side, um, open um, the in now European community after 1967. The European economic community didn't exist anymore. It, it became um, in the um, uh, uh, wake of, of the Luxembourg Compromise, uh, the European community, um, they decided uh, to uh, strengthen, to deepen the structures of uh, the European community in order to make it fit for the first enlargement round. Yeah, the young term, un um, uh, deepening and enlarging. Deepening and widening, that was, that was uh, uh, the, the dichotomy. And what we see here um, is also uh, a commentary on <laughs> the ongoing um, politics of uh, the European community. Um, I don't know whether you are able to read the German text, in case you aren't. Um, when we have climbed uh, the mountain of butter, we will have a great view on the mountain of sugar on the mountains of Syria and far distant on England. So that's uh, the debate um, or the, that's the perception of the situation of the integration process um, on, in December 1969. And we shouldn't forget uh, that um, uh, there was a new government um, in charge in Germany. It was uh, the government led by Willy Brandt who um, had a new concept uh, with regard uh, to the West German relationships uh, to the Soviet Union, to the German Democratic Republic and uh, other neighboring states, his Ostpolitik, his, his Eastern politics, um, uh, were in a state of emerging and he needed the support of the other heads of state of uh, the European community for um, um, leading the negotiations with Moscow, with uh, Eastern Germany, with Warsaw, with Prague, and with other um, um, Eastern uh, European, Central and Eastern European countries. Should be careful using Eastern Europe for uh, Poland and, uh, well, in this case, Czechoslovakia. Um, 
the 1970s, the Hague summit, um, the um, decision to um, create uh, um, a wider but also deeper structured European Union um, was um, um, it was not it didn't become uh, clear to the German public. There was a word going on Eurosclerosis. Europe, only 10, 12, 13 years old, was already uh, well nearly dead, you know. Then hast du einen Opa schicki nach Europa? That was uh, uh, the slogan in these days. Have you got a granddad sent him to Europe? That's the idea. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, European to, to be somewhere in the European institutions was not considered as a, a sort of um, ideal position for ambitious uh, young politicians in Germany. Things have changed since, uh, thanks to uh, our French neighbors who have always considered uh, positions in Brussels as a very important stepping stone for political careers at home. Yeah, uh, It took uh, the Germans a couple of decades to understand that this might be a good idea. And it still doesn't work uh, that well, actually. When you go to Brussels as a German politician, you usually remain there. Um, however, the 1970s, Eurosclerosis, deep crisis, question how to deepen the structures of the European Union, witnessed the launch of the French-German motto. We've already uh, met um, uh, Charles de Gaulle and Konrad Adenauer, we've met Willy Brandt and Georges Pompidou, but the real German, French German motor started with these two guys here. Helmut Schmidt on the one side, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, the doctors who are able to heal the, well, um, decaying maybe um, European community. Yeah, New hope, that was um, yeah, appointed. Uh, it was it was uh, applicated to to these uh, two uh, statesmen, and uh, there indeed is a very special relationship uh, between the two. Uh, this is a this is a, the only photo of of two politicians I've got in my living room, because I I, I really like it. It uh, was taken in the in the bar of of Helmut Schmidt's house in Hamburg, um, and uh, uh, what you see here are, are two really convinced. Europeans. I mean, Schmidt, um, before he um, became chancellor in, in May 72, um, once said, uh, when you've got visions, you should go to the doctor. Um, that's, uh, he actually meant Willy Brandt with it, but it was uh, a bit sort of, of reinterpreted re uh, and, and, and considered as a, as a negative statement with regard to the European integration process. This same Helmut Schmidt, after being elected uh, German Chancellor in May, as I said, 74, went into holidays in July to his holiday home at the Bramsee in the north of Germany and wrote a 40-page memorandum on um, uh, ways uh, to uh, lead Europe out of the ongoing crisis. And it was Valéry Giscard d'Estaing who received, um, the other heads of state didn't know it, uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing was the first to receive it and they both uh, worked on the text, and uh, they really uh, decided which uh, steps should be taken. Schmidt tried to smuggle cooperation on the defense sector in this memorandum, which was harshly rejected by uh, Giscard mm -hmm. d'Estaing because he said, uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing said, well, this wouldn't be accepted in France. We, we don't need to talk about it. Yeah, But the rest was was... Uh, well, it was. You can consider it as a kind of joint venture. You know, Schmidt um, um, wrote the memorandum, and Valéry uh, Giscard d'Estaing read it, commented it, they changed it, and then they presented it to the other heads of state of the European Community. And so they really took their role as doctors uh, to heal uh, the integration process series, I guess. And then, of course, uh, the famous couple um, François Mitterrand and and and, and Helmut Kohl. Um, and I should also mention um, the president of the commission in these yeah. days. Hmm? Yeah, Jacques Delors, of course, yeah. I should also mention Jacques Delors uh, here because it was actually a trio working together mm -hmm. and leading um, the European community into uh, the single European Act, the domestic market, 
and finally the Treaty of Maastricht, and thus uh, the establishment of the European Union, which we know today. I mean, that's up. To, uh, that's that's been these two guys here. And they also um, convinced Margaret Thatcher that the European Community of the 1980s would only, well, nearly only be a free trade area and that she uh, will get her money back and that she should keep calm otherwise. That's it. And if you read the memoirs of Margaret Thatcher, you will find it. In the 90s when she wrote it, she wrote, uh, I never understood the European Union because it was only a free trade area. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but interestingly enough, I don't know whether it's right, but uh, um, I, I, I heard that uh, after the Brexit votum, the, the Secretary of Finance in Britain uh, uh, invited experts in Europe to explain to him what the European Union actually is. It was a bit late, but still. Yeah, uh, what we see here is a shift of power. That's a problem for Germany. Um, we um, have the relation between Mitterrand uh, and, and Kohl in 1984, uh, and we've got a certain change of uh, weight uh, after uh, uh, the collapse of the wall, uh, the end of the Cold War, German reunification, and uh, the whole change of the political arena in Europe. Um, the Germans have still problems with the role. They simply, uh, they, are, they, they consider themselves as, as being Europeans, and that um, solutions have to be found on the European level. But you hear occasional voices asking um, the German Chancellor, um, Angela Merkel, to take the lead, for instance. Uh, the European Union is not made for taking the lead. It's uh, the result of a compromise. And it's the result of night-long negotiations. And if, and that's uh, historically proof, actually, if somebody wants to take the lead, take the lead, the rest will unite against this person. So it doesn't make sense to take a lead because you then will block it. So um, I, I personally think uh, nothing goes without the French-German motor, and that's uh, Chirac and uh, Schröder, who actually were working hard to keep it running. And that's uh, the two um, guys you know, and the others enjoy the ride on the European bike. And that's uh, the French-German motor in 2013 needs some repair, and that's uh, the question, what we should do now. We've got a very ambitious young French president with uh, many visions, which are needed, because what is absolutely clear is that the European Union of today needs reforms, desperately, to become more acceptable for its citizens. The question is, what kind of reforms could it be? I mean, Macron took the typical French way, we have to centralize. I mean, the good idea behind is that he started the debate. Yeah? And we should think about it, whether or not further centralization of European institutions is rather such a good idea. Maybe we can also think of um, identifying certain main areas of politics like, for instance, security politics on the social level, on the border level, on the military level. Uh, and maybe we could also think of, of um, renovating the principle of subsidiarity within the European Union. Leave things to be done on the levels where they can be solved best. So that's my paper. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.